Good morning again, brothers and sisters. You know, I've been here um, three months now almost as pastor in residence. And as I've spoken to so many of you, almost always the same kind of question comes. Um, what does a pastor in residence do? And um, I don't know that I have the answer to that after three months. Uh, I can tell you this, whatever it is that a pastor in residence uh, does, it's a job all, each one of us would want to have. And what a, what a great job, just with no real weight or responsibility to get to to meet with faculty and pray and students and talk and pray and to pop into classes now and again. If Dr. Dockery and Dr. Tianu come up with this job full time, we're all going to form a queue and try to get this job, I'm telling you. I, I've loved it. I, I only have a week left and I, I'm going to miss being here with all of you in the community. Now, one thing I've tried to do as a pastor in residence is uh, sort of infect you with my same idea of what a church is that God has been planning deep, deeper and deeper inside of my heart. I think I've been trying to talk with everybody whose path crosses mine about the fact that I, I believe that God actually establishes local churches within specific neighborhoods for a reason, that they're not simply there by chance, but that there is an incarnational reason why a church exists in the neighborhood where we find ourselves, like we do in Pasadena, California, at the Lake Avenue Church. I, I, I say this because the whole Bible is so incarnational. I mean, when we meet God creating, he digs down into the dirt and he makes human beings. When Jesus enters into this world to rescue it, he takes on human flesh and dwells among us. And when we see him doing his great work of reconciliation, we see him on a cross, in his flesh, on a cross, shedding his blood to bring us to God. So I think there are good reasons to think that there is an incarnational reason for the churches that we are a part of to exist in the neighborhoods where God puts us. So I want you to start thinking about church more and more in that way. Now, why is the church put there? And the Bible gives us a number of statements. Uh, Paul will say it's to glorify God. So in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, to him be glory in Christ Jesus and in the church. So to glorify God, to make known what he is like. And in Ephesians especially, the, the plurality of God, a triune God who's always existed in unity... We who are different, for them Jew and Gentile, are going to declare God's glory through unity. Or, or Jesus would say the, the church is existed and it, it is going to push back the gates of hell. I'm going to establish my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. But when I think about phrases like that, I think both of them are accomplished through a church being involved in the beautiful and powerful reconciling work of God in its neighborhood. And that, that's what I've wanted to talk to you about in these two Timothy messages that I give to you, I've given to you. We at Lake Avenue Church are there in the greater Los Angeles area. We have all of the issues related to urbanization that you'll have in any city that you go to in this world. And we are wanting to step into those places and bring God's beautiful, reconciling, healing, and power. And in doing so, it's messy. Uh, so we have been looking for some biblical guidelines. I think of it almost like jazz. Some guidelines that if we stay within this and move within this, uh, that, that we won't go wrong. And so in my first message on Tuesday, I gave you the first, uh, enter in, enter in. Uh, where you see places of darkness and brokenness in the neighborhood where God's put you, I think we have to go there and be there and enter in as Jesus did. Because I don't think reconciliation is possible until we enter into relationship. And Jesus' life shows us the way. Uh, today, I'm gonna to tell you about the other two. Well, one of them, to call to. When we're in relationship with people, we have to come to the same point that Jesus came to. Ultimately, there was a time that he had to turn and call people to follow him as Lord. And we have to call people to have their lives transformed and changed, conduct, attitudes, minds changed by Jesus. And I'll tell you third, when we actually call people to do that and some will respond and say yes, what so often happens is when you follow Jesus, those things you used to live for are, are taken away 
Uh, many of the support systems that you may have once had are often gone, and we have to walk with. A local church has to be a people, a community, where we walk with this unexpected group of people who have come into the family of God, and it has to be a love-filled, holiness-filled, righteousness-filled, grace-filled community of people. So I want to talk to you about that, those second guidelines. Guideline number two, then, is once we have crossed over those divisions and boundaries that are there, as Jesus did in Mark chapter 7, and enter into a relationship, if we truly have a love for people, we know we must call them to Jesus. And when we call people to Jesus, Jesus must be Lord. And so in, in, in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 to 38, the first passage that Beatrice read for us, Jesus would turn and say, if anyone will come after me. Now, let me, let me tell you again. Uh, Mark's gospel, the very first verse, the title verse, we know who he is. Uh, this is about Jesus, and he is the Messiah, the long-awaited one, and he is the Son of God. And then really for the next eight chapters in rapid-fire fashion that scholars have often um, criticized Mark 4 because he just takes all of these episodes of Jesus and just pushes them together with words like, and this happened, and immediately that happened, kai, kai uthus, over and over again until we're just overwhelmed with the fact that Jesus is the Messiah and he is the Son of God. Uh, even though mostly people are just amazed and absolutely blind to him. So by the time we get to this text, even the disciples are only beginning to see him partially. Kind of like that first healing of a blind man, seeing him a little bit. Peter says, when, when asked, who do the people say I am? They give him all these answers. Who do you say I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. He sees it in part, but he doesn't see it clearly. He still doesn't understand that Messiah has to suffer and die. He just, just can't see that. So at that point, Jesus turns and he says, if anyone wants to come after me. All right, I, I, you need to know that this, this, if anyone wants, is a very technical Greek term. A tis uh, thele. Uh, anyone technically means uh, anyone. <laughs> Who's in the anyone? Who's in the anyone? I, I, I'm just telling you, there are a lot of times, I think, in our churches that, that there are a lot of God's anyones that we don't want in our anyones. <laughs> So I read through Mark's gospel, and I see these anyone's being like four fishermen that Jesus calls. And then later, Peter's mother-in-law. I guess Peter wanted his mother-in-law in. And then, <laughs> then you have uh, a tax collector and sinner that, that comes in. Then, then, yes, there's a synagogue leader that gets in. Then there's a demoniac. Gentile demoniac who comes in, a Syrophoenician woman who comes in, all of these anyone's who come in. So to, to all of the anyone's, Jesus declares, if you are going to be my disciples, this is what is demanded. Now I'll tell you, you have to listen to this. When Jesus himself declares this so clearly, we need to hear the demands that he makes. Sometimes we are almost afraid to talk about them because we say, how does this fit in with what simple faith and belief in Jesus is all about? All I can tell you is this. If we do not listen to what Jesus says about what anyone must do to follow him, we're going to be missing something. And he gives three demands. Number one, deny self. Two, take up a cross. Three, follow. Okay, deny self. I've just got to say a word or two about each of these. By this, at least I think, you know, the, the great enemies that fight the kingdom of God are the kingdoms of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Uh, deny self is taking on which one? It's that flesh side. It's taking on this issue of all of those things, and you and I still feel them, even though we're in seminary. We still feel them, of all those things that we just feel like, I've got to have that if I'm going to be happy. I've got to do that if, if I'm going to be fulfilled. We almost establish our identities in those things, and in our consumerist society. So many times we try to get people to come to church by appealing to this. Come and we'll pray that Jesus will give you those things you want, as if life is to be found in those things rather than in Jesus himself. And, and Jesus says what you and I have to learn how to do is turn those things that we think myself has to have those things over to him and put him into the center of our beings. It's a first commandment demand. Nothing in the place of God. 
And he promises, as hard as that is, that that's where we find life. Uh, Anyone who gives his life, what he thought was his life, his epithumia, his longing, anybody who gives that up for me and for the gospel is going to find your real life, the life of God, the life for which you are made. We must learn to deny ourselves. Uh, George MacDonald, the great Scottish pastor and author, had one statement that I just, it helps me with this. I, I use it so often in the church. Uh, MacDonald would write uh, this, that when first things are put first, second things are not diminished. They are enhanced. When the second things are put first, they will rob you of your life. If anyone will find life in Jesus, it re- demands self-denial. Whew, that's hard. Maybe you should stop there. Two, demand number two, take up a cross. And then you know that if you read the rest of the episodes that follow this, uh, in this middle section of Mark that I call the discipleship section, the three times Jesus says, I've come to die, and it becomes clear that if we follow him, the potential is there for our death. To a couple of his disciples, are you ready to take up the cup that I'm going to take up? To be baptized with this baptism of death that I have to take up? What he is saying is this, that when we follow Jesus as our Lord, we're going to be brought into conflict with other kingdoms, the kingdoms, the systems of this world that will push back against those who've surrendered to Jesus. And they'll push back so hard that sometimes it will even require death as we are faithful witnesses uh, to him. How on earth can that lead to life? And you and I know the answer because each time Jesus said, I've come to die, he also said, I'm gonna defeat death by a resurrection. (laughs) Do we believe that? So that what he's saying is even if following me is going to lead to a, may lead to a physical death, what really matters cannot be taken away. Nothing can separate us from the eternal God who is the only one who can give us eternal life. So those are two demands, denial of self and taking up a cross. But then the third, and follow me. Make no mistake about it. Uh, This is as demanding as the other two. Now, in the very next scene that you read in Mark's gospel, as you get, uh, what Jesus does is he takes a couple of his disciples up on the mountaintop. It's called the transfiguration by us. And there we we have Moses and Elijah show up. And these are the people who often people would appeal to and say, oh, oh, but, but, but what is in our scriptures will tell us not this, not this, not this. They'd misread it. But the voice from heaven declares, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Listen to him. Beyond any other prophet, even good things like Moses and Elijah. And eventually there was only one tabernacle, one place of the true residence of God, and that was Jesus himself. Brothers and sisters, what this means to us and to all of the people that you will ever shepherd or lead is that there are all sorts of other voices that people listen to. And sometimes they're awfully good voice, but they're not his voice. And sometimes the voice of Jesus will call us to go a very different place from where all the other voices call us to go. Now, this should be a sermon in itself. But I'll just tell you almost every week as a pastor how this plays out. I'll have one of the students or the parents of our students come and say, Pastor, this week will you pray that my daughter will get into Stanford or Yale or, or Princeton or Trinity? Uh, <laughs> and what I say is, yes, I will pray for that. But what I must also tell you is this, that when you follow him, his way may be a very different path. And I'm going to ask you to pray that you will find great Faith, joy, shalom in going wherever he sends you. Almost every week I'll have a problem. A young single mom uh, will come up to me and say, Pastor, will you pray? Uh, I, I, we're just not making it that, that God will bring a man into my life who can be a father to these children. Brothers and sisters, I pray for that. Sometimes we have not because we ask not. But sometimes I have to turn and say, but are you willing to follow him and to trust him even if no husband comes in? 
See, there are just so many ways that this applies. I'm sure you can think of a thousand ways that this applies to our society. It is so countercultural. And in one particular way that, that this is playing out in Southern California is this deep thought that the only way I can ever find life, the thing that Jesus talks about here, is if I can engage in sexual intimacy the way I want to have it. In Southern California, for me to get up there and say otherwise is, is declared to be unrealistic, cruel, out of touch with the 21st century. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, you and I, we have to have the love to enter into relationships and want the best for people. We must have the boldness to call people to follow Jesus as Lord, whatever that might cost. And I, I have found that when we follow Jesus, it, it goes against myself, my nature. I think the hardest part about following Jesus is that denial of self part. What do you think? Uh, so how does this play out? I'll, I'll just show you one way that this plays out practically, though I'm guessing, I'm looking at that you're thinking of many ways that this may play out. But this is what brings me to the second text that Beatrice read for us, chapter 10, verses 17 to 31, where this uh, young man probably... I mean, in Mark, we only know that he was a rich man. But, but he comes up to Jesus to find life from every indication. This young man was a good man he, who really wanted to find life. So the world had promised him, if you have power and prestige and all of this, you'll find life. He had it. And he also had heard, I think, from his religious heritage that if you'll keep the law, you'll, you'll find life. And so he had sought to do so. You, you heard it as Beatrice read that. Uh, and in fact, if anyone could perfectly keep it, he knew that, that in, in both Deuteronomy and in Exodus, that the law was given not to ruin our lives. God wouldn't do that, but so that it may go well. So here he was seeking to keep them, feeling that he was having all the things, both that had been promised him religiously and had also been promised to him by his culture and his world, and yet something was missing. So he comes to Jesus to find life. I feel like I know this man. Have you, have, you ever, have you ever met him? Maybe you are him or, <laughs> or, or have that person in your church. Comes good master, he says, with such respect. And Jesus sees us on this matter. Um, why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is good? Don't miss this point. Sometimes it's just glossed over. Does this man, the first Jewish man in all of the Gospel of Mark, actually realize who Jesus is? and his relationship to God. Good master, why do you call me good? Don't you know that only God is good? Then Jesus goes after the heart of the matter. If this one who is good calls him, will he follow? He says to the young man, I see what's keeping you from the life you long so for so deeply. Ah, the problem is so clear to me. Your possessions are possessing you. That, they're keeping you from God. He is the one who is your life. You've made those things your life. The problem is clear. Now, the solution is going to be a bit challenging, but, but it's obvious what you have to do. Go get rid of those things. Sell them. Give everything to the poor. Come follow me, and you will find life. Now, it brings up all sorts of questions that every time you preach about this will, will come into your mind and to everybody else's. How's he going to live without them? Uh, what are people going to say? What, what, what will his family say if, if, if he does this? But the real issue we have to address first is this. Will this man listen to Jesus? Will he deny self and follow Jesus wherever it goes? Mark describes the man's response so movingly. Verse 22. At this, when Jesus says, get rid of it all. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, that word sad is such a strong and poignant word. Uh, it's better translated, I think, grieved. It, it has, and you've all experienced this grieving, something that is lost. It, it's the very word that is used when Jesus felt grief, when he felt a separation from his father. Essentially, when you think about it, uh, what the father was to Jesus, possessions were to this man. 
Uh, is he willing to get rid of that, that first thing in his life, and put Jesus, this one who is good, into the center of his life? But he could not. So brothers and sisters, okay, when you read a text like this, the first thing you and I have to do, and this happens to me every time I prepare a sermon, I say, Father, how on earth can I preach this? I've got to apply it to my own life. Because we too, aren't we? We are called to deny ourselves, take up a cross, and follow. Oh, I'll tell you, everything inside my human flesh rebels against those things. So it first has to be applied to us, but the place where I want us to think about it is, you and I need to have that courage and boldness in this world to call people away from self and to listen to Jesus, which means we have to, to call people to have their thinking, their values, and their lives completely and radically shaped by him. You're with me. I, I can see you are. That first guideline of entering into respect-filled relationships, that is going to be applauded by our society as a whole. Aha, you're a thoughtful church. The second guideline will be scorned. It will be scorned. But to be faithful to Jesus, we must do both. Now, the third guideline. When we call people to follow Jesus as Lord, it so often separates people from their support systems, and they don't quite know how to live, so that they need something. And, and what is needed, I think, a local church, as an incarnation of God's work and glory and reconciling power in a community, must learn to walk with those anyones, those unexpected people who become our brothers and sisters. We cannot leave them alone. So that we have in verse uh, uh, 30, uh, there is no one, Jesus says, who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time with persecutions. All right, uh, <laughs> I have listened to and read so many sermons on the rich young ruler. This is the part that's usually glossed over. Um, when the rich man leaves Jesus, of course, Peter and the disciples are just shocked. He, he represented everything that they hoped that they would become. <laughs> they still wanted all the power and prestige and possessions that he had. And that comes up in the very next episode. You, you can just read that. So they're just shocked by this. And now he's even saying that this man is not, isn't going to have the life of God. Sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. You'll have life. Come and follow me. How, how hard it is. I know it's so hard for a rich man because we become so possessed by our possessions to enter the kingdom of God. But with God, everything is possible. Put him first. We have hope. Now, I could say so many things about this as well. This these are two sermons that should be 20. You, you know that, right? So I'm going to just talk about one thing here today. The fact that if this young man had obeyed Jesus, he would have been left destitute. Have you ever thought about that? No home, all possessions. No bank account. No resources to finance his children's education. No health insurance no matter what happens with that in our country. No prestige, almost certainly. He would have been scoffed at and scorned by his friends and community. What would his children or parents ever have said? He would have been wrung out. Uh, C.S. Lewis, in one of his beautiful, beautiful poems, tries to get at this. I think I put it up here for you, if you can find it. Uh, here's what he wrote. All things, such as a camel's journey through a needle's eye, are possible. It's true. But picture how the camel feels, squeezed out in one long, bloody thread from tail to snout. So graphic. How, how did this man feel? The thing that was at the heart of his life, squeezed out of his life. How is he going to live? How would Peter and the disciples live? I mean, in one sense, Jesus gave the answer that we so often give. Listen, in the age to come, you'll have eternal life. 
Don't worry about it. Heaven's ahead. And it's not, he says more than that, really. The age to come has already begun when Jesus comes. So when we follow Jesus, we begin to experience the life of God now. Amen? Uh, but it's not come in its fullness. There's still persecutions in this world until the kingdoms of this world are gone and the kingdom of God is here fully. So, so what do we do in this period <laughs> where there still are persecutions? And Jesus provides a very practical answer in verse 30. Here's how you're going to survive. You're going to be brought into 100-fold now in this time houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. Now, this is family talk, right? And, and it sounds, part of it, part of it sounds pretty good. At least the two on the outside. I mean, a hundredfold houses, a hundredfold lands. Man, the consumerist society would like that. Sounds really good. But, but wait a minute, what, what about this part about a hundredfold mothers? Anybody want a hundredfold mothers? <laughs> I'm, I'm with Dr. Washington and I have both had three children. Three children is good, right? But 300? <laughs> oh. <laughs> And he throws in that line, with persecutions. What's that about? Oh, man, I'm here with Trinity students, so you already have a good intuition of what Jesus is talking about. He puts it so profoundly here that you have to listen carefully to get it. Did you notice he gives the list twice in verse 29 and 30? I think I have a slide for this, don't I, just so you can see it? Uh, what you leave, what you may leave, if you follow Jesus, house, brothers, sisters, mother, father, children, and lands. Don't worry, what you're going to gain is a hundredfold. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and lands. What's different about that list? What's this is an observant group of fathers. It's added such a clear indication I think the Apostle Paul got it when in Ephesians 3, he talks about this family that's been brought together of anyone's and says uh, that we bow the knee before the one Father. The entire family uh, bows the knee before the one Father. From him, we all derive our name. In this new family of God, there's but one Father. But I'll tell you, there are a lot of other people. And as you read the gospel, you know, there are some, like, like the disciples and the rich young man, who are called to leave all those things, material things, behind and come follow. But not everybody was called to do that. Uh, they would sometimes need a cup of cold water, but some people would have a cup of cold water to give to them. Some people were sent right back into their homes. But you see, what happens is all that's been surrendered, temporary things to the kingdom of God. We are brought into a global family, a global family where within that family, all the resources that are necessary are there to support those who follow Jesus when it separates them from the things of this world. Do you see, is this clear to you? Am, am I making a, a, my mom would say, a lick of sense? <laughs> this is what Jesus is, is foreseeing. And this is what I'm declaring to you that the local church is to be within the communities where God puts us. We enter in, we call people to make Jesus as Lord. It is going to put them sometimes in almost impossible places, but they're never going to be alone. And my deep conviction that the resources that are needed to live until the work of God is completed will be, he will not leave his people without the resources needed to do his work. Now, what does this look like in our churches? I better look at my watch. Oh, I, I have more time than I thought. I usually, I'm glad I have time to talk to you about this. <laughs> what does this look like? And I, I'm just going to tell you, I, I hope you sense that I'm still very much learn, learning. Uh, if you come out and visit us at Pasadena, which I hope you will, January is a good time to leave Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to come and look at this church and say, boy, that sounded so much better when he preached about it. <laughs> it it's, this is difficult work, and, and we're st still very much becoming. So I want you to know that we're a church very much becoming. 
So what does it look like? And I've been finding some mentors and helpers, and two of my main mentors and helpers are two of our Lake Avenue Church missionaries. Let's see if I can find my notes for them. It's Randy and Edie Nelson. Um, Randy and Edie are uh, amazing people. Uh, for 14 years of their life, they were called to work in the Turkana region of Kenya, uh, among a people that if we were to go there, they would have looked like a Stone Age people. They were a nomadic people group that were declared to be absolutely unreachable, had been a burnout for many, for many followers of Jesus. Uh, but they went there. Randy was a relatively new believer, and my joke is he had never learned what God can't do. So he, he, he just believed everything was possible. 14 years later, 14 years later, almost the entire people group had come to Jesus. They had been discipled, they had been trained, and they were actually sending out missionaries to other nomadic people groups, and their work was done. So common sense, strategic planning in the way we do it, we would say send them to another nomadic people group. No, 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 you know where they ended up going? They went to world-class city, Bangkok, Thailand, and especially focusing in, in the resort city of Pattaya, Thailand. Now, if you don't know, Pattaya, like so many of the cities of our world, including our own country, has become a major center for the trafficking industry. Um, I asked Randy and Edie, how do you approach this? How, how do you engage in, in, in ministry in a place where there is so much brokenness? And here, here's what I wrote down that they said. When we go to a new area, we walk prayerfully among the people and we ask God, what is broken here that needs your healing? What is wrong here that you want to be made right? The answer is everything. But then we ask for wisdom to discern what the most important things are. Then we ask God for more wisdom to know what first steps we should take toward reconciliation. And then we start. Now here's where they started. They were down at the local bus station, and they saw young children and teenagers coming off the buses day after day after day. They were being sent there often by their families to get into the trafficking industry, into the bars that are there, in order to raise money. Why? To alleviate the homelessness and poverty that were back home. They, they didn't know how they were going to, to survive. Uh, Randy and Edie, in their way, looked at that and said, that's not right. <laughs> That's not how those families wanted their children to live. That's not how the children themselves want to live. That's not how he, God made his creatures to live in this world. That's not right. So they took a first step. Uh, they, they put together the money, the support money uh, that, that they received as missionaries, and they rented out the best banquet hall in, in, in Pattaya. I think it was in the Weston. And then they went out and they invited, both at the bus station and in the bars, all, they started with the young women to come to have a banquet celebrating the value of each one of their lives. Uh, the local churches that heard about this said, you can't do that. And I said to him, I didn't even know you did that. We were afraid to tell you, he said. <laughs> he, he said to me, but they also said, nobody will come. And um, the first night, 76 women came. And, and they celebrated their lives and they told them about the love of God for them in Jesus and many of them came to faith in Jesus. Second night, double that came. Over 150 women came. The same thing happened. Many, I think I have a picture or two. I, I, are they shown up there? It's, I preached there. I was sitting on the front row and Randy said, Craig, will you pray that our church wouldn't look like every other church? I said, Randy, I don't have to pray about that. It doesn't. <laughs> it simply doesn't. Almost all of the people who have been rescued out of the trafficking industry. What he saw was this, that, that if they were going to follow Jesus as Lord and their lives were going to be conformed to the image of Christ, that the very thing they were sent there for was to, 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 serve, to support their, their homeless and, and their struggling families. And so they had to find other places of work and of financial support. And they had to bring them into a family and that church is called True Friend Community. True Friend Community. It's one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen. Uh, they are witnessing the reconciling power of God. Edie said to me, well, when you're preaching at a seminary or a church and, and you go out there and you say to people, uh, do you ever wonder if, if the presence and power of God are real? Just send them over here and they'll see it. They are seeing the renewing, liberating, reconciling 
power of God. And so I came back and, and just said, let's approach the task in California, San Gabriel Valley in the same way. Uh, so we've gone and prayed and talked with our city officials and tried to say, where's the greatest area of brokenness? We identified a couple of years ago four major areas, a homelessness, public education. Uh, we were the second community in America where busing was forced, which still devastates our public schools, so we're engaged. Uh, all the issues related to immigration and uh, issues related to incarceration and the reentry program of prisoners being let out of prison because the state ran out of money and trying to welcome people in. We, we seek to enter into relationship. We, we seek to show the love of Jesus and to walk with people in dis distress. I'm just going to tell you this. It is messy work because the effects of sin are messy. But I'm going to tell you this too. We're not a boring church. <laughs> we, we need to lean on the presence and the power of God because the issues we are dealing with in people's lives go far beyond our ability. And so many times we, we have been evidencing the power of God to change lives. He does have the power to end the hostility and to make peace. He has the power to take what is broken and to bring it back together again. So, what does a... Uh, pastor and residents do. <laughs> I, I've come to try to share with you a vision for the church, an ecclesiology, and, and to urge you to, to prayerfully consider whether it might really be true that God plants, locates his churches within particular neighborhoods incarnationally to be the centers of his reconciling work. I want you to consider that and then to be engaged in doing that work. The way it, it, it plays out, you gather with your church family in, in worship and in, in, our, in small groups, and God furthers his reconciling work in you and me. He begins to bring, bring together the brokenness in our lives and set us free from some of those addictions and, and help heal our marriages and, and our families and, and our relationships. So as he is doing that, we who are in process are sent out to be his ambassadors of reconciliation. Because I declare to you, there are no God-forsaken places in this world. There is no hostility greater than the power of God to make peace. There is no brokenness greater than the grace of God to bring restoration. God loves this world he made. He, he sent his one and only son into this world not to go out and condemn the world, but to rescue the world through him. And you and I are among those being rescued, amen? <laughs> and we know this, as Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5, that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. One of my favorite phrases in the whole Bible, not counting people's sins against them. And God has entrusted to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors Ambassadors for Christ. God will make his appeal through us. And it will be to his glory. Amen. May I lead us in prayer? Father, I pray I've been faithful to your word. Where I have been empowered through your Holy Spirit. We are gathered as people here who love the church, who are training to serve in various ways the church. Plant a seed from your word in our hearts and lives. We will obey, we will follow, we will listen until your work is done. In the name of Jesus, amen.